We brought the scale model of the exhibition up to the gallery floor so that we can all start to really imagine what the visitor will see when we finish our installation in about two months. As you enter at the far end, you'll come through a kind of huge, wonderful, prehistoric wind-up that ends in a biology of the horse and what makes it such a unique animal for its interaction historically with man and man's interaction with the horse. And that big wind-up leads to the pitch, which is really this huge central gallery that is a kind of uncreated circle, the center of which is status and spirituality. But all of the other aspects of our interrelationship with horses, how we shape them, how they shaped us, are kind of wound around that center nucleus of the exhibition. For the evolution of the horse, what people are going to see is a diorama featuring Nebraska 10 million years ago. In addition to the kinds of horses that are related to ones still with us today, there'll be some extinct ones, forest dwellers, animals that ate leaves rather than grasses. And what the visitor will see is a reconstruction of a scene featuring not only the horses in their natural landscape, but other kinds of animals that lived there at the same time. The artists that I work with really shine in this kind of work, and it's so large. We have spent all this time working on all the separate components of it, the leaves, the trees, and everything. And as it's starting to come together and seeing what it's really going to look like is a very exciting moment. It's not completely finished, so it's, it's still, we're, we're, we're still looking at it and trying to get a picture of what it's actually, the experience is actually going to be, but I'm fairly certain it's going to be a slam dunk. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a diorama that's exclusively to illustrate work in Central Asia and Kazakhstan by our co-curator, Sandra Olson, who's worked there for many years. This is one of the oldest known places where there's a really good set of evidence that suggests that the, horse, the horses that lived there were domesticated. And by that I mean they weren't collected there for the purpose of butchering and, and eating. They were actually collected there because the people themselves ascribed something to them. Now, what was that? Some of it might have been wealth. There is some tentative evidence that they were actually milking the mares, which by itself implies domestication. So there was a, a food source, but a renewable one. It, just, it, it was not the same as hunting, which was the earlier phase of the human-horse interaction. And there's interactives here as well. People are going to get an idea of how Sandra interpreted the site, what the different kinds of artifacts and position of bones mean to somebody who's a student in the interpretation of them. It'll be pretty exciting. What's interesting to me about having the model in the gallery is seeing what the early ideas of how things were going to be arranged and look, how they are actually coming out now in their final and the bow tie, for instance, actually is pretty similar to what we're ending up with. The, mo this, the model of the little village here looks quite a bit like what we've actually built. I think the bow tie diorama is so important, that excavation story, because we need circumstantial evidence, in a sense, of the relationship of man and the horse in terms of being able to manage herds, because unlike dogs, dogs for example, have the morphology changes as we breed them and the shape of their skull changes and so on. But with horses, they've remained, at least the extant horses, remained virtually the same for quite a number of millennia. So it is the kind of evidence that we can show here that is so important. You know, for, for domestication, for subject matter like that, it's actually quite abstract when you think about it because it's not just about breeding for specific shapes and uh, purposes. It's also about behavior. One of the things that you want in a domesticated animal is that it takes orders sweetly <laughs> without lots of problems. And to illustrate the whole range of factors that go into domestication was actually pretty hard. We had to toy around with several things. I think one of the parts that visitors are going to really like is the biology of the horse over on this end. And that's because it's an interactive. What we'll have is a moving image of a horse on a screen and kiosk and computer stations in front of you. And you'll be able to 
play around with horse anatomy in the sense of taking a look at its ability to hear or its ability to see or how it runs, things of this nature, even how it digests. And as a result, you're going to walk away with an understanding of the innards of the horse that you'd never get in any other way. The thing I love about that, too, is that it's like the visible horse that we all remember from our youth, but it moves, right? I mean, the notion that it can breathe and kind of turn its head a little and look at you is, I think, such a funny new spin on how to, how to do that kind of information. <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes you just wish you could just have a sure. horse plowing, running through the gallery at full speed. You just feel like, oh, that's what it really wants. And yeah. to try to find objects and media and other ways of creating that ambiance is, is challenging. Well, sport is a challenge also because there is just a tremendous range of sports and range of roles of the horse in the sport, sometimes with humans, sometimes without. And then there's a range of the development of sports over time. So... What we have is we have a, a replica of a fragment from the Parthenon frieze. We have the Triple Crown trophies. We have evidence of early Mongolian sports on horseback. And so there's just a, such a broad range. We've got much more to cover it all. Well, that, that was it right there, trying to make it international in scope and not just an exclusively North American sort of story. Because horse sports really are about as international as you can get. But how to show that in a way for our audience that communicates what we want to communicate was the challenge. I think personally, one of the, th one of the things I really love, one of the objects I really love is that ceramic horse from India. And I think it's because you just don't think about India when you think of horses today. Yeah. And this is a piece that was suggested to us and a story suggested to us by one of our collaborators, the Canadian Museum of Civilization, this is not a culture where horses play a role in daily life, but they do play a symbolic role. And I, I just think the object itself is phenomenal. It's so big and ornate and fragile. <laughs> so we, we can't wait to see it in place safely. What we wanted to do was honor the horse and its role in the development of civilization. But there's some hard nuts to crack as well. What's the future of the horse going to be like? What do we think about the way horses are used in racing and other kinds of sports where they're really in danger of life and limb every time they go out on a, on a track? This is something that we needed to deal with as well. We couldn't just tell all the good, pretty pictures. We had to tell some of the others. And that was a hard business, trying to decide what was appropriate. That was a story that I really learned something new working on the exhibition because I really assumed this is going to turn out to be a breeding story. You know, we've bred horses to have these very thin legs. That's it. That's the problem. And frankly, it seems like the problem that's insoluble. So when we started poking around and learned the information about tuned tracks and how the track can be changed in a way that can really be advantageous, just like we change tracks for human runners, I had no idea. And I thought that was a really, I think that's a really surprising story that we've got in here. There are multiple challenges in an exhibition like this. We are bringing an animal to life, including its history, its future, and the implications both for horses and for man, and putting it all together, something for everyone, I think, something that, that can only really be done well in an institution like this together with our collaborators.